Good afternoon and welcome to everybody to our first MED 2020 virtual meeting. Uh, the, the mantra, the tragic mantra we have been listening in the last two months is that the pandemic is affecting and will affect heavily the most vulnerable individual, states, region. There is no doubt Middle East and North Africa are vulnerable regions after decades of war, instability, and socioeconomic shortage, and that the pandemic will further affect, most likely further affect, the economic, political, and security landscape also in the Middle East and North Africa. It may also affect diplomatic and political relations with the region, and here comes today's meeting focused on rethinking European engagement in the post-pandemic Middle East. We can count uh, on many of you following us, more than fi 500, but we can count on a distinguished virtual panel. On top, we have the great pleasure and honor to have with us Marina Sereni, the Italian Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Deputy Minister, you have the floor for the opening remarks. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you very much, distinguished guests from the academia, civil society, international organizations and governments, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure for me to welcome all of you to the very first regional meeting of the Rome Med Dialogue Initiative. Despite our physical distance, we have made it. I would like to sincerely thank ISPI and the EUA for being our partners in this, in this initiative under the framework of the State of the Union. In this particular moment, we have become aware more than ever about the global and regional interdependence. It is therefore crucial for Italy and the EU to, brought, to project a common positive agenda globally, and with particular regard to their neighborhood, the enlarged Mediterranean region. In this challenging scenario, MED Dialogues find a new and strengthening meeting. For this reason, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and ESP are launching a series of virtual events with the key institutional and civil society actors on the major geopolitical, economic, and social issues affecting the MENA region. With the explosion of the COVID-19 pandemic, the concept of security has become increasingly affecting, affected by its human dimension. The key lesson to take is that healthcare is a global public good. The well-being and good health of European citizens is strictly connected to the one of the people in the MENA countries and vice versa. We are not at war. We are fighting a low intensity conflict against an enemy that is well established in our territory in a way hard to understand and with an extremely high level of mobility. To win such conflict, we need an extraordinary degree of determination, resilience and solidarity. From the human perspective, the COVID-19 pandemic has erupted in a scenario of ever-increasing severity of global humanitarian, humanitarian needs as a result of enduring armed conflicts, extreme environmental phenomena, as well as pre-existing epidemics. In such context, we are particularly concerned with the impact of COVID-19 in fragile countries with a weak healthcare system. Countries where the number of vulnerable people, such as refugees, migrants, internally displaced persons, returnees, and asylum seekers has been increasing over the last years due to conflicts and instability, as in the case of Africa and in the Mediterranean region. These people are often sit settled in reception camps or informal settings with extremely precarious sanitary conditions and health services. This makes it difficult to implement the measures necessary to prevent and fight the virus, such as social distancing. Restrictive measures on the movement of goods and people adopted by governments to contain the spread of the virus have hampered 
the operational and aid delivery capacity of humanitarian organizations. The EU can play a key role in rendering the current international cooperation system fairer and more effective. It can, it can advance its model based on institutional and societal resilience. Moreover, the EU can become a major leader and donor in the global action against the virus, fostering socio-economic resilience in the most fragile and vulnerable areas with particular regard to the large Mediterranean region and Africa. In this regard, it is important to foster an integrated approach at the EU level to help partner countries and fragile populations in their response to COVID-19. We strongly support the Team Europe approach based on strong coordination and synergies among EU institutions, member states, and development banks and agencies. Italy has also cons consistently promoted the need for an international alliance to fight COVID-19. We have responded to the UN call to fight the pandemic through extraordinary final contributions to the World Health Organization, to the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, and to the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. Finally, Italy play a key role in contributing to a transformative multilateral agenda, will play a key role to a transformative multilateral agenda through its G20 chairmanship next year. According to IMF provisions, we are facing the greatest economic recession since 1929, with different levels of severity among countries and income level. The Mediterranean area is foreseen to go through a contraction of minus 2.8% in GDP growth, while Sub-Saharan Africa a minus 1.6% per all in GDP 2020. On top of this, the economies dependent on the production and export of fossil fuels are severely affected by falling oil, oil prices in a context of geopolitical rivalry, diminished global consumption and production. However, despite these looming figures, some opportunities are there. In a context of disruption in global supply chains, we mar where market proximity dynamics are likely to prevail over cost advantages, the enlarged Mediterranean area strategically positioned between Europe, Asia and Africa and uh, Asia and Africa has the potential to become a major logistic hub, fostering shared reg regional prosperity. The already existing social fragmentation would worsen in the post-COVID-19 world, both in Europe and in the MENA region. According to the ILO, Arab countries are projected to face the highest drop in working hours in 2020, minus 8.1%. On top of this, the virus tends to have a stronger impact on economically and socially disadvantages, disadvantaged groups, undermining social cohesion. After over a year of social and political turmoil, bringing some positive changes, the square of the enlarged Mediterranean region are now mostly empty. The process of peaceful transformation of societies risks a sudden halt. The virus could favor a return to the status quo or worse. It is therefore important to continue upholding the reformist agenda of the movements in Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, Iraq, the COVID-19 outbreak could lead to a humanitarian crisis in the most fragile areas in the MENA region with weakened healthcare services and limited financial ca capacity. This is particularly true in the Gaza Strip, the most densely populated place in the world. Refugees and people living in, con living in conflict set settings such as Libya and Yemen, are the most vulnerable to the pandemic and must be protected. Italy has continuously 
provided humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable people in Libya, Syria, Palestine, and Yemen. Furthermore, the Italian cooperation has directly shipped via Syria, sea or air, necessity goods towards the most affected countries in the region. Italy has supported from its outset the UN Secretary General's appeal for a global ceasefire to contrast the pandemic, both directly and with the EU and the international partners. It is now crucial that regional stakeholders and all parties involved in conflicts seriously commit to it and give peace a chance. In Libya, the UN humanitarian truce was rapidly followed by a quick es escalation of fighting over the past few weeks. The continuous use of force on the ground severely undermines any attempt to control ongoing pandemic, pandemic risks. In Yemen, the UN brokered ceasefire was short-lived. The hostilities between the coalition in support of the legitimate government on one side, side and the UTIs on the other have not sought. The recent declaration of autonomy by Southern Transitional Council increases the risk of fragmentation in already extremely fragile situation. In Syria, after almost 10 years of violence, the population is now confronted with a new, potentially devastating threat in COVID-19, and they have very limited access to life-saving machines and pharmaceuticals. Looming tensions in Idlib and the recent deadly attack in Afrin remind us that the risk of further escalations is real and the threat of extremism and terrorism, including the recrudescence of Daesh, remains strong. In such context, where even under the COVID-19 crisis, no concrete progress has been achieved, the EU should preserve its role as a constructive player by promoting bilateral dialogue among regional stakeholders and by facilitating all the existing mediation, mediation initiatives. When considering the Middle East peace process, the pandemic could also accelerate controversial political maneuvers. The EU must therefore remain vigilant. In this regard, despite strong and noticeable cooperation between Israeli and Palestinian health authorities, the occupation obviously remains the main theme, the main theme as well as the continuing threats to the possible annexation of large parts of the West Bank and the Jordan Valley. Should these unilateral actions be implemented, any possibility to resume the peace process and to allow the viability of a two-state solution will be seriously undermined. For this reason, the EU should, in line with the statement recently released by the High Representative Vice President Borrell, continue to monitor these developments and spare no efforts to try to avert such scenario in coordination with the EU, US, and all relevant actors. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that we should become increasingly aware about the far-reaching and long-lasting political, economical, economic, social, and humanitarian consequences that the pandemic can have in the in large Mediterranean region as well as in other parts of the world. For, for this reason, Italy and the EU must not lose their external projection in the area through adequate support and by fostering a positive common agenda with all the key actors involved in the Rome Med Dialogue spirit. In line with their values, Italy and the EU should also continue to support the peaceful requests for reforms brought forward by civic movements in the region, democratization, respect for the rule of law and human rights, economic and social justice, the fight against corruption, sustainability. Thank you and good job for all of us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister. Grazie, Marina. Uh,
The Deputy Minister uh, has uh, outlined uh, most of the important issues we will be debating and dealing with today. We will now have uh, four panelists, four distinguished pan panelists I mentioned, which will uh, further frame the issue with a five minute kickoff uh, uh, intervention. Uh, since we are discussing the pandemic, I think I would start from uh, Ahmed Al Madari, who is uh, the uh, director for Eastern Mediterranean for the WHO. Uh, Ahmed, can, could you shortly, as in all we virtual meetings, give us an idea of what the situation is and what uh, we, you are doing? Sure, sure, Paolo. Thank you very much for giving us this uh, very great chance to come and, and share with you, you know, Emerald situation. And thank you very much, Marina, for shedding light on real challenges that we are all facing here in Emro, particularly those countries with, uh, you know, uh, instabilities, instabilities and political uh, sort of um, conflicts. Um, thank you for sending the, the very clear message, the message of solidarity, the message of unity to uh, face this uh, challenge, this pandemic together. And we share you, you know, that message we put as WHO uh, as a whole, you know, our hands on your hands. And we assure you of our full commitment. Uh, anyway, if you don't mind, uh, Paolo, I'd like to share with you this quick presentation. There are many health uh, security challenges that are posted, or, I mean, posed by COVID-19 in EMR. And Marina have mentioned uh, many of these. I mean, like, for example, there was a disruption of non-COVID essential services in all countries here in the region. And we have been repeatedly mentioning this to health authorities and health leaders. And we are making making programs for that. There was an e economic impact on economic, you know, uh, and job security in the region here because of either lockdown of, of uh, cities and, and uh, the whole countries, uh, shutdown of all, um, you know, factories and industries. So th this is a real challenge we are facing. Social impact of the lockdown as well, as well, you know, we have noticed it very seriously happening. And that's why, in fact, we started, you know, working with uh, authorities in, in, in different countries and with other UN agencies on issues relevant to this lockdown, like for example, mental, mental stress and relevant psychological issues. Uh, it has impacted the, this food, the global food security. And there are many, many challenges here happening in the region, particularly countries with the instabilities. There was, un, you know, definitely, we noticed it, that unprepared healthcare systems when it comes into dealing with this pandemic. So that, that the list of challenges is really huge. Just to share with you uh, the epidemiological data here in Emro, as you can see, we had up to yesterday a total of 220 positive cases from all Emro region, 22 regions, I mean 22 countries, uh, ranging from uh, below uh, 100 to um, about uh, above 100,000 uh, cases, uh, with total deaths of around uh, 8,250 deaths reported, mainly from Iran. And as you can see, you know, the cumulative um, the case for, um, you know, uh, the, the, the curve is almost stable um, because of the up and down cases from each individual country. Now, when we talk about IMRO countries uh, without Iran, we notice there is an increase in the number of the positive cases as well as, as the reported deaths. Maybe one of the reasons for that is the active surveillance uh, strategy that have been followed by many countries, particularly uh, well-resourced countries in the region here, like Gulf countries, like um, Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan, Egypt, and, and other countries. Looking at Iran, in fact, we have noticed a sort of, uh, you know, uh, decrease of the epidemiological care for the last five weeks. But, you know, if you notice at the end of, of the right side of the graph, there is a sudden increase of the positive cases, and this was due to uh, easing, you know, easing the public health measures in Iran. And in fact, they have started um, releasing some of the tough uh, lockdown measures and, and uh, mass gathering restrictions. That's why we noticed there is an increase in the number of the cases, and we are following it up closely with the health authorities in Iran. Now, when it comes into the pandemic, we have had you know, one unique approach as a WHO, an approach that asks the government, it is different sectors, either governmental and non-governmental or private sector coming together 
and also asking the whole community, individuals and groups of individuals, or the whole community and society to come together. And there is a, a work between the two, the government and the whole society. So that was the message you know, we have sent to the, to the government without which we will not be able to fight the COVID. Now, when it comes into the strategies, as I said, we have a global strategy and we have national strategies. And it is clear from the graph here that, you know, for the global strategy, it is composed of five main components, control, suppress, reduce, develop, and mobilize whatever resources, including the communities. When it comes into the national strategies, it starts from coordination and planning, engagement and mobilization of communities, find, test, isolate, you know, and take care of those positive cases and uh, those uh, tracing of those uh, who are contacting those positive cases, provide whatever clinical care and adopt the strategy based on the risk and the capacities in each uh, country. Now, when it comes into the risk into, to, to humanitarian you know, capacity city, I mean, the settings, as have been mentioned by Marina, it is really huge. We have weak health systems in these uh, settings or in, in these areas. We have a very big vulnerable group that we need to take care. We have high risk group as well, especially you know those who are in camps or a displaced population. We have a problem of uh, as accessing essential supplies, uh, either relevant to the healthcare system like medicines or PPE or diagnostic supplies. We have ongoing ongoing humanitarian crisis for you know operations outside the COVID. Uh, sort of relevant areas, and continuity of non-COVID-19 health services, as I have mentioned before. Now, when it comes into the transition to post-pandemic state, we have been following it up with uh, each individual country as well as other UN agencies, including as well donors, uh, countries or uh, organizations. So, you know, we have, con we have to, to, to control the transmission, build the capacity of the healthcare systems, reduce the risk by strengthening the tracing and the surveillance and whatever measures that have been implemented uh, as a public health measures and engage communities. It is one of the main pillars for our fight against this um, sort of pandemic. Uh, post uh, pandemic state, as all experts say, it is not going to be for weeks or months. It may extend for maybe a year or more than a year. So we have to accommodate ourselves. We have to accommodate ourselves to the new world, to the new norm, as, as they say. Um, potential impact, as it is, has been mentioned, many, including uncertainty of future of the pandemic itself, uh, extended uh, global recession with its impact on the economy and the social and other dimensions of life, um, major setback to the SDGs achievements that have been done in the past. Now we have to relook at it. And um, last is you know sharing the success stories when it comes into bringing all leaders. Uh, into this sort of, of um, fight against this pandemic. All leaders are there. and We have seen it ourselves at regional, national, and global levels. Solidarity and partnership, as Marina have mentioned, we really appreciate the support that have been given by Italy in specific, but the European Union in general, to EMRO states and other donors. It is really appreciated. The utilization of the influenza pandemic you know, experience in the past it has been well utilized uh, by, by different countries. We created a very strong risk communication strategy in collaboration with many other agencies like UNICEF, for example. We have had an effective diagnostic capacities. Yes, we are facing difficulty of securing these diagnostic capacities or, I mean, kits and tools, but still we feel, you know, in a very quick manner, we managed to get the right uh, tools to help us. We invented a lot, you know, in, in digital uh, and IT, and it, the time has come for its utilization. And this meeting, as you said, uh, Paolo, this is a very good example and reflection of how IT can be utilized. And I'm sure this sort of new norm is going to be with us forever, you know. And uh, working with, uh, you know, many partners like Duran Partner, we have been working with them very closely. They helped us in sending their experts, like for example, to Iran during the technical mission and some other countries here in the region. And last is the ser service continuity that we have to make sure you know, those group of people who are receiving their service will not be cut short of that service like maternal uh, services, child health services, patients suffering from TB, from uh, HIV will continue Ahmed. getting service. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo, and I'm very sorry if I am quick and I took long time. No, no, it's always, thank you, Ahmed. It's always unpleasant to interrupt 
uh, interesting presentation, but in a virtual meeting is also more difficult because I didn't know how to, 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 to reach you. Uh, for the next panelist, I will uh, uh, signal when one minute is left uh, because I want to get uh, one of the good point of this virtual meeting is that we can get questions from all over the world and get you get back to you. Uh, I will now move uh, to um, Maha Yaya, who is the director of the Carnegie Middle East uh, Center in Lebanon. Because Ma Maha, be before we started, uh, before we went on air, we were commenting among us, and uh, Randa told us that 25% of the American workforce is unemployed. And I reacted saying, this is uh, the average uh, always in uh, the south of Italy among young people and also in many of the countries. So, uh, 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 but the big issue is that this 25% will most likely become 50%. So please tell us something on the humanitarian risk and costs of what's going on, as Ahmed already mentioned. You have the floor, Maha. Thank you, Paolo, and thank you for convening this panel together and inviting me to be on it. It's a pleasure to actually even see you virtually. Uh, I'm happy Italy is coming out of the dark tunnel that it's been for quite some time now. Um, just on the, before we get into the humanitarian costs, to take a step back and look at some of the forecasts. Um, the, in January, uh, there was a forecast that the world economy could contract by 11% in the first half of 2020 and lose about six trillion in economic output as a result of the pandemic. That number is probably increased by now. The IMF is saying that the MENA economies will shrink by 3.3% during 2020. So it's even worse than what was uh, predicted uh, before. Now, when it comes to MENA countries, the issue is, as uh, Her Excellency mentioned, the question is not just the number of people who are becoming unemployed. Yes, it could reach 50% uh, of unemployment. We're already seeing mass layoffs across the region, particularly in countries like Lebanon, where, um, uh, the, uh, where, we, where we already had an economic crisis prior to the pandemic. But in places like, uh, for example, Syria, Libya, Yemen, where you have an ongoing conflict, um, the crisis is such that already um, uh, uh, the, the, a, a large portion of the population was either displaced or refugees. There are 70 million refugees around the world. Um, half of those are, and internally displaced, excuse me, that's almost like a small country. Half of those are in the MENA region. Um, these are people who have little access to health services. Um, uh, they uh, are mostly without a job and dependent on aid. Uh, many of them, if they do work, they work in the informal sector. Therefore, they have no social protection whatsoever. Uh, and with the lockdown measures, they've been forced to stay at home. Now you add to that the large number, I mean, there are 70 billion people who work in the informal sector around the world. Um, the MENA has a huge number. We don't know exactly how many because there's never been an accurate uh, compilation of how many people there are in this region who work in the informal sector. But there are different percentages for Egypt, for Tunisia, ranging from 38% of the workforce to 42%, depending on, on, on who you're talking to. The bottom line is, again, these are people, these are the vegetable vendors, they're the taxi drivers, who are not able to go, I mean, they're being given a choice, and they've said this, we're being asked to die of hunger or to die of COVID-19. If we don't work, we cannot put food for our families uh, on the table. Now, what normally would have happened and what is happening around the world and other countries is that governments are kicking in and providing the needed, uh, you know, uh, if you like, uh, uh, conditional cash transfers or direct cash transfers to support these families during this period. In many countries, particularly those where, as again, in conflict countries or in countries that were already fragile, like Lebanon, where and the fiscal space doesn't exist, that process has become almost impossible. So literally, we're beginning to see cases of malnutrition. We're beginning to see a lot of the ripple effects of people not being able uh, to eat uh, properly. 
there are projections that poverty in this region is likely to uh, increase uh, tremendously. Um, and um, we, we, uh, we're not quite sure yet how, how, uh, by how much, but it's going to be a significant increase. Uh, what they're talking about 50 to 60 uh, million, uh, the, the number of people reaching uh, the hope that are determined to be uh, poor. Um, it, in conjunction with this, if we are to also look at uh, additional factors of fragility, uh, in this region, in addition to conflict, rather than seeing a roll down, a kind of a backtracking uh, in conflict, we're seeing an intensification of the conflicts in some places because the participants or the stakeholders on the ground are seeing this as an opportunity to push forward their own political agendas. Um, uh, for example, the, uh, the, in, in Syria, uh, the Russians and the Chinese, that's not conflict, but we've seen them try and push for a lifting of sanctions against the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, in other places, we're seeing, uh, in Iraq, for example, we're seeing ISIS rear its ugly head again uh, and try and take advantage of uh, power vacuums on the ground uh, because of COVID-19 and the lockdown measures associated with it. So this is also quite critical at this particular point in time uh, because it does create uh, a- Maha, one minute. One Sorry, minute. one minute. Okay. I will then end with two points. Um, one is that the COVID-19 is also highlighted, as I was outlining, in terms of poverty, in terms of access to health, insurance, social protection. COVID-19 has highlighted some of the structural inequalities in this region, particularly around access to health care, income, opportunity, okay. etc. Uh, and it's brought them into much sharper focus and will become a big issue. Finally, it's going to create significant challenges uh, for governance in the medium to long term, uh, because the carrot and stick approach that was uh, you know, uh, around before uh, is, no, no, is, is no longer viable. The stick was more or less challenged in a very big way in 2011, and even though uh, they're still coming back to the security apparatus over and over again in different countries. Um, the, the barrier of fear is broken, and we see this in the different protests, and I agree with the minister, deputy minister, that we need to try and support these protests and their demands to the extent possible. And the carrot is no longer possible because with the decline of the uh, oil prices, the fiscal space to try and buy people off is simply no longer there. Um, I, will, I will stop here and we can extend later. Thank you, Maha. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will go back to this issue very soon with the question and answer session. Uh, you uh, anticipated, as well as uh, Deputy Minister Marina Sereni, that uh, what we have described so far will have and is having an impact on the political situation, already fragile, and on conflict, you mentioned an intensification of conflict, and you gave us a few examples. Randa Slim is the director of the Conflict Resolution and Track 2 Dialogue Program at the Middle East Institute in Washington. Uh, could you, Randa, elaborate more on these political and security uh, implications? Yes, good morning, everybody, at least from my end of the world, from this part of the world, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Paolo, good to see you. Thank you for SP for inviting me to be on this uh, panel and honored to be on this panel with the other colleagues. You know, I have been looking at data and literature on um, this epidemic to conflict relationship, especially whether there have been studies that have been done and how epidemics contribute to conflict and whether in some cases they cause conflict. And to be very honest, there is not a lot of rigorous academic research on this, especially using economic trick models. A lot of the research has been done around the HIV AIDS epidemic and their impact on African country. There was one study in 2006, which used a strong economic econometric model, which provided uh, strong evidence of a causal link between HIV and the prevalence of civil conflict and civil disorder in 112 countries. Uh, however, all of this research seems to indicate that the impact of 
an ep epidemic, armed security and conflict usually goes through three channels. One of them is the political channel, the second is the economic channel, and the third is a social channel. And I think both, uh, uh, you know, uh, all previous speakers, uh, the two previous, uh, the three previous speakers highlighted already some elements of these three, of, of the factors at each, in each of these channels. For example, in the political arena, let me, let me focus on how, for example, epidemics affects the social cohesion among, of leading elites, especially if these epidemic protract and, and, and governments are unable to provide uh, services or, uh, you know, prove to be inadequate. So there will be a lot of, you know, name blaming and scapegoating within the ruling elites for the performance of uh, the government. In the case of the Middle East, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the political level uh, is, uh, for example, the social contract the impact on the social contract, even in GCC countries. Uh, citizens are accustomed to certain uh, benefits from the government. Uh, the COVID epidemic, its impact on the economic downturn, the uncertainty of when the global economy and global demand uh, for oil will pick up again, which is not likely to happen in the near uh, term to medium term, is going to really test that social contract that has bound citizens and government in GCC countries. And that might create tensions in countries which have been seen stable, you know, pretty much stable for now. Uh, on the social level, for example, and Maha referred to that, about the increasing inequality. I think what the epidemic is showed is exacerbate and highlight and deepen this existing inequality. For example, let's take lockdown. There are only groups in society and small groups of societies that can afford to telecommute or that can afford to have their kids get schooling on the internet, that can afford to stay at home and, 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 and weather uh, the financial uh, setback. And so what you are going to see is that marginalized vulnerable communities IDPs, refugees, but also youth, women, uh, uh, people with disabilities, they are going to be even more affected. And again, research shows that the impact of, one impact of the epidemic is on social cohesion, on social inequality, on, 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 by, 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 by exacerbating social inequality, and that's a driver for long-term uh, conflict. Now, on the economic side, and I think Maha referred to that, uh, uh, you are going to have countries that are um, already in a, in, a, in a fragile situation economically because of years of conflict. Uh, and so they have no capacities almost to, uh, to deal with, to, di to provide the resources needed to help their citizens, their SMEs, you know, whether uh, the financial uh, implication of COVID. But also um, on the economic side, you have countries like, that are job producing, that are One minute. Labor, yeah, labor exporting, that are middle income, Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, that are going to suffer from the drop in remittances from their expats in GC countries, as GCC countries, tighten their belts and start basically firing foreign workers and also the drop in tourism dollars. Much, a, a big percentage of the economies of Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco comes from tourism dollars. So that's going to have impact, of course, on unemployment, but also on stability. One last point, one last point, what we, and, and Maha referred to that, is what we are going to see in terms of contestation of the authority and legitimacy of the state. And we are going to see that happen from groups like ISIS, as we have seen recently in Syria and Iraq. But also we are going to see it from groups like Hezbollah in Lebanon, from groups like, uh, you know, uh, PMF in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq, who have access to resources and are going to basically come in and try to fill the economic void that usually has been, you know, caused by, by the by the impact of the epidemic on the country's finances where they operate. I'll stop here. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Randa. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a gloomy scenario from the, the three presentations. What came out is a, a, a really gloomy scenario. Uh, and we are facing in, in all our countries a very gloomy uh, situation. And at ESP, what we are trying to do, uh, and it's not always easy, is to keep the light on on other parts of the world which are facing at the same time a, a, a difficult situation. And as Ahmed said, uh, and everybody said, we have to cooperate even if we are facing difficult situation, as Deputy Minister mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, now we are moving to the last panelist, uh, uh, Stefano Manservisi, who has been uh, Director General for International Cooperation and Development. He has been everything at the European Commission. He is now a distinguished fellow in at the CGD and the ODI. Uh, Stefano, uh, the, the title of our meeting is uh, rethinking the European engagement in the Middle East. Some may even question there is an engagement, at least at political level, uh, versus other actors. And some may question or may underline that we have been talking about rethinking the European engagement uh, many times after the Barcelona process, after the Arab Spring, after uh, uh, the terrorist uh, uh, ISIS and so on. Uh, I'm sure you will be able uh, to convince us that what, this is not true and this is the right moment. <laughs> well, thank you, Paolo, and thank you to, to Marina and to all the other speakers, you know, because after the introductions and the pictures of them, my job is on one side much more difficult, precisely because I have to try and indicate some tendencies in the union, on the other side, easier because I have not to repeat a certain number of things. Uh, I think that from the European point of view that uh, in this moment I'm not representing, therefore I keep a bit of freedom also in describing what the Union is, uh, is doing. You know, I would like to, um, uh, let's say, recall what it has been done um, today, now, and what is the challenges which are ahead. First, uh, what has been done? Well, the Union has mobilized 2.1 billion euros uh, quite quickly, you know. It's not new money. Uh, let's be clear, it's not new money. It's money which has been reprogrammed, reoriented in agreement with the partners, meaning therefore sound dialogue, you know, in order to address essentially the three um, dimensions of the first, uh, 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 let's say, hit uh, uh, on, on the countries. I mean, the first one is the humanitarian aspect, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the uh, the fact that uh, you know, there are needs of supplies, needs of uh, material, needs of uh, help in order for people to survive and to cope with uh, the impact. The second one is on the health sector, obviously, because not just to supply, it's to keep, keep them up, you know, and uh, to make sure that these uh, uh, sectors can uh, become resilient in front of something which uh, is supposed to last. In any case, we don't, know, we don't know now how long. And the third, exactly like in Europe, is the fiscal space. You know, it's the, in the, it's the help to the economies to remain more or less afloat, to keep uh, employment, or in any case, to intervene from this point of view. Therefore, 2.1 billion with the, the gathering together of all possible instruments that we have. You know that the toolbox of the union is fragmented. It's not, it's not uh, one. And therefore, you know, the effort uh, to put together the different sources in order to target all the, the three issues that I, I, I underlined, you know, was particularly important, including mobilizing in the quickest way. First, not inventing new channels, but working a lot with WTO, responding to the call, responding to the call of uh, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, re responding to the call of the UN, so making at the same time something which is not creating new structure and underlining the multilateral approach of the union. And therefore, they say the, the partnership, natural partnership with the UN institution and where all the partners should be together, like the G20, etc. So therefore, this was the approach. And the mobilization through uh, budget support and macro financial assistance. I would like to recall that Tunisia uh, is benefiting from 600 million of macro financial assistance, which means, you know, 
cash in 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 uh, in term of grants or, or hyper concessional loans into the budget of the state because the best way is to help the fiscal space in the country so therefore all this has been done um, quite quickly but with existing money multilateral approach following the call not inventing anything sound dialogue in order to put money like in our experience in europe you know in order to enlarge the fiscal space that these states have. At the same time, working in the framework of the IMF, the G20 and the World Bank in order to address the issue of debt, which is also, let's say, very important in the MENA region, which is adding fragility to fragility, because obviously the fiscal space is not just the cash of today, but is also the capability of getting on the market in order to have more. And therefore, uh, the, the, the EU in particular, you member state of your area are working as much as possible in the IMF and in the World Bank in order to contribute to something which has just started because the discussion about debt has just started and the decision taken by the G20 to postpone, you know, the payment of the service is, in my opinion, totally insufficient. And therefore, this must be, let's say, rolled over and we have to discuss the matter. But I think uh, that uh, there is now what next, you know, because this was an important effort, but what next? I mean, what next is not only an issue for the MENA region, it's an issue for the, the European Union. Because if the European Union, in setting up its own recovery plan, plays uh, or makes a choices, which is uh, of not understanding that the recovery of the Union is intimately linked with the recovery as, as a priority of the countries in the MENA region, then there will be a problem. Uh, therefore, this will imply that, uh, let's see what will be the proposal of the multi-annual financial framework that the Commission reshaped will, will propose. As I hope as a minimum that it remains the amount increased for the region, which were just for, for, uh, foreseen before, but I hope that they will be increased. Because, you know, if, we, if, if the Union doesn't understand or doesn't give sign, you know, that its own recovery is extremely linked with the recovery of this region, then there will be, in my view, a political problem and, and a huge mistake. Something that should quite uh, quickly, let's say, push to rethink uh, what is the neighborhood, actually, you know. I mean, the neighborhood policy since uh, its inception in 2002, say, you know, has, became, has, has remained more or less the same, based on one assumption, a rich and prosperous Europe, enlarged to the maximum, and then let's organize all the others around this in order to, they say, allow sharing a bit and not enlarging further. This was the basic approach of the neighborhood policy. Now, this worked a bit at the beginning, in my personal view, it didn't work in the, in, in the more recent time because we, we are living in the, one of the most unstable areas of the world. Therefore, not, not everything is responsibility of the Union, but certainly the Union has not played visibly, you know, which kind, the, the kind of role that it planned to have. So therefore, it's not just a question of money, which is important, extremely important, but it's a question of model to be discussed because uh, you know, I think that in the moment when Europe, for example, is rethinking, let's say, the position of Europe in the international trade, in the organization of the supply chain, on the definition of what is strategic and what is less strategic, in the sense of creating, uh, let's say, areas of stability in, in terms of cohesion, in terms of perspective, in terms of uh, the drivers for for, for growth, like digital economy, for example, you know, and Green Deal, you know, this kind of issue will become, or should become, rather, the real new field on which to build a new neighborhood policy. A neighborhood policy which, in my view, should be part of the redefinition of what Europe could be as a standing, not alone, but as a standing on, in, 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 on its own foot, you know, uh, in a world which is multipolar in a world which, without playing now in too far away, but with the United States, with China, with Russia, with others, which are in any case competing for influence, for models, uh, for, for capacity of credibility, 
Well, I think that if Europe, if the European Union is missing, you know, after the injection of money, after the construction of uh, one minute of, uh, of, of uh, let's say of a more sustainable plan, if it dissociates itself from the definition of the solution that Europe will have to find in order to be better equipped to stand in this multipolar but still ungoverned world, you know, and it dissociates itself from a project to be discussed with the MENA partners in, as a priority, well, this will be a mistake. And I think that this will be it's the real challenge that the Union has in front in the next months, I, I, I would say. Uh, is a question of investment, is a question of dialogue, is a question of uh, redefining a bit what is keeping us together. And therefore, you know, the issue of stability, of peace, of fragility, of poverty, of uh, poor social cohesion, you know, cannot be dissociated. You know, maybe supply chains could be redesigned in order to be shorter, in order to have more protagonism. And it's not just to say, let's participate to our internal market. I mean, the internal market of the union is under stress. Everybody's seeing that in this day, you know, with even a sort of risk of its existence. Now, if the internal market uh, of the European Union after, after the crisis will have to be built not only as a free space, but also as an industrial policy program, well, this should be discussed with the MENA countries, and this should be discussed in order to have an area which is much more integrated. This is what I think is the challenge that we have, uh, in, in, in front of, of, of us in the next month. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you very much. We have received uh, many questions, uh, and I will try to, to uh, pick up uh, one for each. Uh, one second, because it's, I can see them. Okay. Uh, there is one question for, uh, uh, I will mention all of them and then give you uh, the floor for a short uh, comment. Uh, a question for Randa. Uh, co will coronavirus, can coronavirus decrease dynamic of war situation in Syria. Then a question for Maha. Uh, how will coronavirus reshape popular protest, protest across the region uh, and in particular in Lebanon? For Stefano, uh, the European Union has approved a mission in Libya. How is the crisis going to affect it? This is a tough question. And then there is a question for Ahmed. How much is Ramadan affecting the spread of the virus? Uh, there, there is some reference to the situation in Cairo, to the poorest area in the city uh, where lockdown is not respected and not controlled. So will, be, will this uh, affect the, the trend that you described at the very beginning of your presentation? Please, Randa. Yes, thank you very much. Look, in general, again, study, studies about conflict, uh, the impact of epidemics and conflict talk um, in terms of whether it reduces conflict or increases conflict. There are different, there are contrasting opinions of this. There are academics as well as policy analysts who say, you know, because the economies shrink, because parties have le less access to resources, they are going to be less willing to wage war or to continue in a war. That's one argument. There is another argument that say, in fact, no, because of the economic difficulties at home, parties will be more motivated to, to, to wage more war, so deflect attention from it. And also there is the war economy, is that as the national economy fragments, the war economy then has, you know, becomes more of an incentive to continue the war because it provides benefits to the warring parties. In the case of Syria, I think we have a number of parties who are going to be influenced by the developments in a different way. So you are going to have groups like, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 uh, the regime, uh, as well as uh, you know, maybe some of its backers who think the epidemic create conditions that should, you know, that should incentivize them to gain more ground. And, and proceed further. You have a group like ISIS, which we have seen early April wage one of the most coordinated, you know, sophisticated attack 
uh, in the Badia region. And so see the vacuum created by the epidemic as being, again, an incentive to regroup and regain ground. And then you have the external actors like Turkey, Russia, Iran, that have maybe different incentives. You know, we are seeing already reports of Iran pulling some of its forces out. Uh, Russia is increasingly worried about how, a, an epi how the epidemic is going to affect its forces on the ground. You know, Turkey, we're already seeing Turkish soldiers, uh, you know, um, being infected by COVID and then maybe eventually transfer that into the refugee. So in my opinion, all in all, if I put all of these together, this assemblage, I think the likelihood is that this conflict will continue and we're going to see ebb and flow. We have seen recently a, you know, lull, a pause in the, in the, in the, in the violence, but we are going to see that, uh, you know, go up again. And I think, in my opinion, if we put all these factors together, in fact, there will be more incentives for the different parties, local and regional, to continue waging this war, having calculated that the epidemic is in their favor. Thank you, Randa. Maya, uh, the, the, your the question is on the protest and the implication for Lebanon, but let me add to you and to the other that someone is asking also uh, for a short comment on which country do you see more at risk at the end of the whole situation in the region, the one with less resilient or more uh, uh, economically and politically at risk. So two questions in one. Yeah, I'll start with the second one, Paolo. I would say, uh, I mean, obviously conflicts, uh, countries in conflict are the most at risk, but I would now also add Lebanon to the mix because Lebanon is already facing a catastrophic uh, economic meltdown. Uh, a crisis of political legitimacy, its entire political system is in question, um, and now a, a health crisis, a pandemic, um, the, the, which has aggravated the, uh, the economic uh, meltdown that was happening way before corona began. Uh, just to give an example, the protests broke out on the streets in October. Between October and December, something like 220,000 people had lost their jobs. Uh, businesses are closing left, right, and center. Um, the banking sector, which was one of the key pillars uh, in the Lebanese uh, system, is under threat. Recently, the government put out a, uh, a plan which talks about $83 billion in losses to the banking sector. And the central bank, which normally would have been the one, the one institution to step in and support, provide, uh, you know, stimulus, economic stimulus, to, this is what's happening elsewhere, to provide economic stimulus for businesses to restart again, is unable to do it because it itself has a deficit. So it's a real mess. Inflation is skyrocketing. We've seen the price of basic goods like sugar, for example, uh, increase by 67% uh, between March 2019 and March 2020. Uh, same with rice, with salt. So really basic goods, we're seeing a doubling and tripling and quadrupling of prices depending. Now, in terms of the protest movements in this context, um, I, I think that uh, we're going to see three kinds of transformations. One has already happened. We've seen a lot of organizations and individuals involved in protest movements in places like Lebanon and Iraq move to the humanitarian space. Um, the COVID-19 has, and we see this in every crisis, people leave what they're doing and they move into the humanitarian space because there are people's lives are now at risk. So we've seen people set up food banks in Lebanon, for example, trying to make sure that families get their weekly rations. And this is all on the uh, privately donated. This is not sustainable. It's great. It's fantastic. It's a good bridging mechanism, but it's not sustainable in the long run. The other uh, way I see uh, protest movements already also change is they're moving as we are to the online uh, world even more. So there are discussions now happening online in Lebanon and Iraq and other places between different groups of uh, protesters. Um, they, they're trying to establish, I mean, these are networks that were already established, but to try and see what would the next step be? How do you then move from a social movement to uh, which has a lot of people 
to a movement that is able to impact political change. So this has nothing to do with COVID-19, but COVID-19 again has intensified that discussion mm -hmm. and forced them to try and think creatively about this. And I'm already seeing in Lebanon, for example, some of these groups moving towards institutionalization, creation of political uh, entities. I won't say political parties, but entities. One last comment. Yeah. Um, one last comment is the, um, we will also see some of these movements become more violent. We're already seeing this in Lebanon. Uh, unfortunately, because as the situation becomes more dire, as people are losing their jobs, they have no way of feeding their families, they're losing hope, um, then more and more people are, I mean, the kind of people moving to the streets now, um, they, they mean, we, we are already seeing more violence in that, at that level. And my concern is that if in a country like Lebanon, where there are weak state institutions, um, this can create uh, power vacuums in places that where the political parties are not able to step in. Um, and we may have serious security repercussions emerging from that. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ahmed, uh, the question for you is, uh, 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 how will uh, Ramadan affect? It's an issue, religion and, 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 uh, and co co coronavirus is an issue everywhere. Also in my country, there, is, uh, uh, there has been debate on how to stop uh, and how to uh, avoid uh, spreading of uh, the virus. What's your reply to the question? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Paolo, for this uh, important question. In fact, um, as you all know, I mean, Ramadan is strongly linked with, um, um, you know, specific behaviors and features that are mainly linked with mass gatherings, starting from, uh, you know, activities like breaking the past together as a small families or uh, big gatherings, uh, coming for uh, prayers as a small group or a large media groups like what is happening in Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, so based on that uh, sort of fear we have during Ramadan, we started weeks before Ramadan, in fact, uh, negotiating and discussing with uh, some Islamic groups like the Islamic Advisory Group, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and we worked on developing documents in close collaboration, you know, between uh, us and in WHO and the Islamic Advisory Group uh, and scholars. That document was, uh, you know, working as a guiding document to countries you know, telling them what are, and communities and individuals, what is the best way of dealing with this year Ramadan, you know, the new, the new way of doing our sort of rituals during this new Ramadan with COVID-19. Based on that guiding document, in fact, many countries, even ahead of that document, have taken tough measures when it comes into uh, postponing, you know, a lot of mass gatherings, cancelling these mass gatherings, like, for example, closure of mosques and the closure of, uh, the, you know, this mass uh, breaking the past most of the countries and most of the communities adhere to that. But unfortunately, you know, one of the main challenge, some of these uh, communities did not adhere to that sort of recommendation. I totally agree with you that this put us in, in the risk of, of, you know, spreading more the COVID-19 uh, uh, infection. But uh, in spite of that, you know, we insisted by sending various messages using various tools, either TV channels, newspapers, social media, uh, uh, targeting individuals and, and groups of individuals and families. Uh, the risk is there, but uh, it is much better, you know, if I can say when it comes into the mass gathering compared to last year with, with no COVID. With COVID-19, it is much better, but still the risk is there. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is now the question, the easy question for Stefano. Then I have one question also for uh, Deputy Minister Marina Sereni, but since she will give uh, closing remarks, I will, I will get the question at that point. Uh, Stefano, please. Well, I think I uh, will respect oh, the time allowed because uh, otherwise it will take uh, years uh, and uh, it will be quite difficult. But let's say, I, I guess that the, the mission, which is uh, the, the subject of the question, is the Irini one, no? is, is the successor of Sophia mission uh, in particular. Um, well, first, uh, I think that uh, on a situation like Libya, um, COVID will accelerate process and make them more complicated. It's not that they're changing, I mean, dramatically, you know. Um, simply, they, they will attract interest and urgency for action, I hope, much more. It's not just a question of containment, 
the Iranian mission is uh, to uh, fight against the struggle of, uh, of, of arms and oils, etc., or what is illegal, is to enforce the embargo, um, and also to rebuild uh, some form of common management of the of the of the of the management of the border on the sea from the European Union. But in itself, uh, even if the starting point uh, is uh, is positive, is in reality a bit, a bit weaker than the Sophia as it was uh, considered at the beginning. Now, COVID will uh, simply accelerate some form of contradictions in order to do much more. The mission in itself is not, in my view, the test for the impact of, uh, of the of the of the virus is rather the acceleration of the process inside the, the country and uh, in the countries which are in fact covering the different factions which are fighting in Libya. So the mission is a revelator, but uh, what uh, is the real issue for the European Union, in my view, is not only to help in finding a new mediator of UN, which would be a good thing, you know. I regret personally that uh, that Rantan Lamamra, who was was uh, was uh, suggested by Guterres, has not been chosen, but nationality for some, but the man was top and was able to do many things. In any case, first, the union should be on the forefront to, to help in finding somebody credible, because, because uh, this is usually important. Second, Allow me to say that the Union, going even beyond the Irini, should take its, its own responsibility. You know, there was a ceasefire which has been, uh, which has been concluded. You know, it seemed to me that, uh, apart from talking about uh, the security, uh, the European army, etc., there should have been an immediate thing that the Europeans should have done, to put uh, European troops monitoring this ceasefire. Otherwise, uh, useless that we complain that the Turks and the Russians are doing. You know, I mean, Libya is in front of Europe, is part of the MENA region, is part of this area on which the security, the prosperity and the stability of Europe itself is at stake. One day we can call it migrant, the other day we can call it terrorism, another day we can call it economic development because of oil. But in reality, this is the issue at stake. And I think that if COVID can suggest something is to step up a bit, you know, and therefore to take that in a more, let's say, politically, active, less, less declaration, a bit more action. I mean, what the union is doing is correct, basically. I don't, I don't question that. But you know, I mean, Libya is a, is a, is a, is a territory now of a, a proxy war. And you know what I mean, you know, between two camps, you know, is of yesterday, the news of new troops, a hundred of uh, servicemen eh, of Wagner, which are there, which are countered by new people coming from Syria brought by the other side, you know. Do we want really to have another Somalia with, uh, let's say, a proxy war managed by others in front of our shores? Do we want this country to implode? I mean, definitely. I mean, we made the choice to support a government which is not controlling big part of, of, the, of the country. So le let's make something. Irini, it's important. Irini, allow me to say, is more important for the Europeans to find again a common ground uh, to, let's say, fight against uh, smuggling and maybe to manage migration a different way, a bit less for, for Libya itself. Now, I think what is missing, and maybe COVID will suggest, because certainly this will amplify the crisis within Libya and maybe some horrors which used to happen also in the country because of uh, the refugees, because of the migrants, etc. And maybe to suggest to, to the Europeans a bit more proactive, and I am not, uh, you know, in favor of war intervention, etc. But if the Europeans are serious, they have to be on the ground in order to ensure ceasefire and to ensure mediation in support to the UN, but in a more proactive way. Thank you, thank you, Stefano. Uh, and I will now turn to Deputy Minister Marina Sereni. Uh, which I don't see right now. Uh, so uh, I will take uh, one other question which was uh, left. Uh, someone asked uh, if whether the coronavirus crisis will stimulate in the region. Oh, sorry, Marina, but let me, let me have this question anyhow uh, to, uh, to Maya. Ma. 
uh, will the coronavirus uh, increase uh, 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 rejection even in the region of refugees? Um, okay, yes. Um, I'm not sure that, I mean, there, there is already an anti-refugee sentiment in different countries, but I haven't seen an intensification in that sentiment during this coronavirus. The concern has been, the stigmatization has been that refugee center settlements are most likely to be become hotbeds of infection. This is the stigma. That hasn't happened. I take Lebanon, for example, and all Jordan, where you have, in Jordan, you have actual camps. And in Lebanon, where you have a lot of informal settlements, we have not seen the, the large kind of them becoming hotbeds of infection. Now, the problem, the challenge always is, we don't know the extent to which there is testing, etc. In fact, there's only some, some, some cases were found in a, in a refugee camp in the Bika. So yes, I mean, sentiment and reality are two different things as is often the case. Yeah. But that, that looks like one of the very few good news uh, in the entire hour we spent together. I wonder if Deputy Minister is uh, uh, with us, because this time I will not have a, another question <laughs> to <laughs> ready for you. Uh, uh, she is not. Uh, so I have one question to Ahmed, uh, which was, we came before. What, from your standpoint, from the uh, sanitary situation, the most urgent, most needed tool that is missing for you to face this situation? Uh, thank you for this uh, you know, tough question. Uh, you mean uh, for uh, the 22 countries here in Emro, if you talk about the 22 countries, one of the top listed, and I hope it will be uh, seriously taken by uh, you know, all countries in the region here is, uh, let us put aside all our political differences. Let us put aside all political uh, differences and come together to fight uh, this pandemic. As have been mentioned by colleagues, you know, uh, out of the 22 countries, 12 countries, almost 12 countries are facing or, I mean, suffering from either protracted emergencies and conflicts or acute emergencies and conflicts. That, you know, the, the amount of destruction in these countries is really huge. Some of these countries before the Arabic, you know, spring, some of these countries were just steps away from the Millennium Developmental Goals to reach go to them now, you will see they are 100 years back from the SDGs. So the, my main message is, you know, those leaders, those different authoritarians in, diff, in these countries, you know, in, in one country we have maybe have three or two leaders or, or, or authorities. Let us come together. Let's, let us work together to serve the humankind, to save, you know, the, the lives of people. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to succeed in fighting this pandemic and uh, the test for us uh, is very difficult and we will lose. And generations, generations either will remember, remember us for the good or the bad if we do not come together, you know, in, in, in fighting this pandemic, putting aside all differences, societal, political, economical differences. So that is the top, list, top, top thing that I wanted. Uh, I have another question in the meantime. Uh, no, wait. Uh, uh, Mar Marina, so, sorry, I was ready to give you the floor. And uh, let me uh, have one question for you as well. Uh, how should uh, the European Union react to the annexation of part of the West Bank and Jordan announced by Israel and the United States with the deal of the century? Can... For react, I think we have to prevent. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to change the situation if unilateral steps will be taken. So I think, and we are pushing in uh, our partners in Europe to do this, to, to make steps now towards the Israeli new government uh, to prevent the idea of annexation. Because, you know, when annexation is taken, it's a very big mess and it's very difficult to, uh, to revert. 
the, the situation. So uh, I think that uh, I know that our ambassador with the other colleagues uh, in uh, Tel Aviv, in Israel, uh, made already a, a step towards uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry of Foreign, of Foreign Affairs in Israel, uh, to, to put on the table this position, please don't make any unilateral step about annexation, and please stop also the new settlements, you know, around the Jerusalem, because they are illegal. Uh, but now we have to wait, that the, because we do not have a new government uh, yet, even if it will be in a few days. Uh, and uh, I think we should be, as Europeans, united on the traditional position of Europe. You know, it's not easy, because some countries are uh, have a, a different uh, sensitivity on this, but it's very important that the U U European Union is stick with the, the traditional position and will prevent the idea of unilateral annexation. Uh, our position is this one, and we will do all our best to, um, to have this unity of Europe on this point. Uh, uh, Marina, would you like to uh, have a, a closing remark apart from the, the question? Uh, I don't know, perhaps only to, to thank all of you. I'm, I'm staying here. I'm sorry because I, I had the telephone call be before, so for two times you called me and I, I was in the room but not hearing you. Uh, but I'm staying here uh, till the end of the seminar, so, but perhaps just to, to, to greet you and to thank you for this uh, uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you, Marina, but this is the end. Uh, meaning oh, okay, <laughs> okay, so you, I, I didn't understand because uh, I was there just calling, uh, just with a telephone call. Okay, thank you. Uh, no. Thank you. Uh, all of you have uh, had uh, points that are very interesting and very useful for us, for the political side of this webinar. Uh, we want to continue to work on the Med Dialogue uh, events. Uh, I hope very much that in some way in December we will be able to have the, uh, the meetings in some way, in some way, and uh, perhaps different, as you told at the beginning, perhaps in a different way than in the past years, but uh, I hope very much that uh, the MED dialogue could continue and could uh, uh, see you in Rome, all of you in Rome. Thank you for the meeting and uh, I will continue to, to follow also the, the, the seminars that we will organize in the next uh, weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister, and thank you for closing with a positive note. Uh, I, I, I mean, all, all, all of you have been at the hotel in Rome where we host uh, a med and know the corridor. Uh, my, uh, my host <laughs> is, my is to imagine social distancing in that corridor. But, nightmare. Uh, nightmares, yes, thank you, not ghosts. Uh, um, we, it, a dark picture came out and we knew that. But uh, in dark time, uh, we keep our lights on. And in dark time, uh, MED keeps the light on the Mediterranean and North Africa. We have always done that, uh, uh, even more so now that the time is dark uh, uh, everywhere, especially in, uh, in this uh, uh, region so close for many reasons to us. Uh, I wish to thank all of you. Uh, I wish to thank uh, uh, the State of the Union Initiative and uh, the European University Institute, which have been partner of this uh, webinar. And uh, uh, see you soon with the other initiative of MED Virtual. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paolo. Grazie. Thank you. Bye. See you in Rome. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. Ciao a tutti. Bye. Oh, God.